after a few remarks about the problem that was facing physics um, in not being able to find the ether in which the electromagnetic waves were imagined to propagate, um, Einstein changed the game completely, changed the rules of the game um, by postulating those two what mathematicians would think of as axioms, I suppose, namely that all inertial frames are equivalent for all physics and that the velocity of light is the same in all inertial frames. These statements depend on inertial frames. We have to have inertial frames just as we had to have before Einstein. So that, that part didn't change. And as Einstein was aware, that would have a big impact on uh, the allowable transformations from one frame of reference to another frame of reference. It would dramatically change uh, how we perceive the geometry of our space-time, um, how we think about it. So I set up the standard configuration for you yesterday and we ended up with the uh, Lorentz transform, which I'll write down again, T dashed equals gamma T minus Vx over C squared. X dashed equals gamma uh, X minus Vt. Y dashed equals Y and Z dashed equals Z. And that's the, that's the standard Lorentz transform. It's not the most general Lorentz transform. It's the, it's the sort of standard one. That you only get that nice form if the two frames of reference are in this configuration, this standard configuration. And I pointed out, and it's sort of obvious, that if you have two frames of reference in general position, not lined up beautifully like that, then, in, then the transformation from one to the other will also involve translations in space, translations in time, rotations in space. Basically, so that you can line up the two frames of reference like that and synchronize the clocks. <coughs> um, one of you asked me after the lecture, I, I said during the lecture that these, these equations are quite easy to establish. And one of you asked me after the lecture, are they? How do you do that? So I'll spend just a couple of minutes showing you that first one. We know that we argued yesterday that the transformation is linear because both observers have to agree about straight lines in space-time and that's because they have to agree about which particles are free particles. Free particles by Newton's first law moving in straight lines with constant velocity. And so you just write down a linear transformation T, X, Y, Z, E, yeah. And the question is, what are these coefficients? <coughs> but you can see, and this didn't occur to me when I was first asked this question, you can see that if Y equal, if, if you're somewhere in, in space-time where Y is zero, then you're on this X, Z plane, which is also the X dashed, Z dashed plane, and therefore y dashed is zero. So y is zero if and only if y dashed is zero, independently of everything else. Okay? If y is zero, you're on this plane defined by these two axes, but it's the same as this plane. So y dashed must be zero. So y equals zero and y dashed equals zero imply each other And uh, if you put that in, then that immediately tells you that, and that must be true for any t, uh, t or x or z, 
And so that tells you that A must be 0, B must be 0, D must be 0, and E must be 0, straight away. OK, so it's quite quick, actually, to see that Y dashed must be some constant times Y. How do I know that constant must be 1? Well, there's another trick which I used yesterday, which was that I exchanged the roles of the two frames of reference. And I want to say something else about that in a minute as well. Um, <coughs> I rotate this frame around so that Z dashed goes to minus Z and X dashed goes to minus X. And I do the same for that one. So Z goes to minus Z and X goes to minus X by rotating it round. 180 degrees about the vertical here. And then we're thinking of this frame as being stationary, being still, and this one moving in that direction at velocity v. So we have absolutely an equivalent arrangement. So that was this. Um, so what you do is you exchange, uh, if I can find it here, yeah, you exchange t with t dashed, you exchange x with minus x dashed, because we moved that round. We exchange y and y dashed, and we exchange z and minus z dashed. Now what I didn't say yesterday, and one of you asked a question about it, and it didn't hit me at, at, at the time, is that when we did that exchange yesterday uh, to finish our calculation of this transformation, we were using the first of the two principles of special relativity, which I labelled SR1. We were actually using the fact that um, these two frames of reference are absolutely equivalent for all of physics and therefore whatever transformation you work out for s thinking of s dashed as moving it must be the same formula if you use it for s dashed thinking of s as moving okay that was the whole point of that axiom and we needed that in the middle of the calculation because we used that e exchange in the middle of the calculation to, to get another equation and then to do some algebra and then to get that transformation. If you look back at your notes, you'll see that we needed that. And, uh, and in particular, in fact, I'll show you the two equations. One of them was, um, I'll put it over here. I haven't finished this yet. I'm coming back to this. One of the equations was x dashed equals gamma x minus vt. We did not know at that stage what gamma was. And then I did this transformation and I said, therefore, x equals gamma x dashed plus vt dashed. And then we did some algebra. I multiplied them and... I can't remember what I did now. But anyway, we did some algebra. We needed both of these. And this one comes from this one. But we need the gamma to be the same. And it is the same because of that first principle. Right. The two frames of reference are equivalent. And so it must be the same formula. OK, so that was something I, I didn't point out yesterday. But now I have. How do we use this here? Well, if we, if we do this reversal on here then the only thing that we're actually doing is flipping those two around. And so this equation becomes y equals c y dashed. And you can see from these two equations that c must be plus or minus 1. If those two equations are true, then c must be plus 1 or minus 1. So which is it? Well, it can't be minus 1 because imagine taking... Um, a sequence of transformations where you use smaller and smaller values for v. Right? You, you, you make v gradually smaller and smaller. Then in the limit as v is 0, of course you have the identity transformation. 
If V is zero, clearly you have the identity. And so that could only be possible if C was plus one here. All right. And therefore, Y dashed equals Y. And you can do exactly the same for the uh, <coughs> fourth equation here. Okay. So I, I, I forget, it was you who, who asked me this, wasn't it? So that, I hope, makes it completely clear. Um, I wanted to show everybody, because in my experience, if one person asks a question, that means that at least 10 people have the same question. <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, so that picks up that question, and it also picks up the question about where did we use SR1 in our derivation of the um, Lorentz transform. The other thing I wanted to say at the beginning of this lecture is a few more words about the index notation. Where instead of a, a vector x, um, we use instead of that symbol, for, instead of underlining the vector to distinguish it from a scalar, we put an index on it. And we think of that index as, as taking different values corresponding to the different components of the vector. Um, so it's the same, is that, I mean, th if this vector had components x0, x1, x2 and x3, where uh, one of you was not quite sure, but these are not powers, right? These are just labels. So then you can just think of X as A as taking four different values, one after the other. A can be zero, and then you've got this component, one, and then you've got this component, and so on. This notation... Um, some mathematicians hate it, but usually they're mathematicians who have never had to do any calculation involving curvature. <laughs> okay. So in special relativity, it's possible to avoid using this notation completely, um, but it's a bit fiddly. I've never tried to do it, but I would guess that it's possible to do it. Um, but if you're going to do general relativity, and I hope that you all will at some stage study general relativity, then writing down um, the, 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 the various curvature components, because you're, you're going to be discussing a curved space-time, and doing calculations with curvature and geodesics and so on, turns out that the index notion, notation is much easier than, than, an index, than any index-free notation. So there is a bit of a battle in, among mathematicians about which notation should be used, I admit. But that's why I put it into my lecture notes here. And the only other thing I, I, needed to, I need to mention now is that I wrote down this matrix. So now both of these independently can take the same four values, right? 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's this matrix, M... 0, 0, M, 0, 1, M, 0, 2, and M, 0, 3, and then it's M, 1, 0, M, 1, 1, and so on. So that's what, that's what that symbol means. It means all of that matrix. And then what I wrote down in my lecture notes, and I sort of assumed that you were all familiar with this, and I'm sorry if you were not, I wrote down a contraction. I wrote this thing down, M, A, B, X, B. And in the index notation, there's an implicit understanding, a convention, introduced by Einstein, actually, that this means, this actually means the sum from b equals naught up to 3 of m, a, b, x, b. So wh what Einstein said was, we, whenever you see a repeated index here, 
actually there's a summation symbol which he said, I'm not going to write it down. I'm fed up with writing it down. But it's there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that's any time there's a repeated index, you have to imagine or put it in if you want to at the beginning of your, when you're not familiar with this, it's not a bad thing to do, but you'll soon get fed up and say, okay, the repeated index means summation. So in particular, this means MA naught x naught plus m a one x one and so on m a two x two and m a three x three where that's the first component of that vector that's the sec second one and so on and if you if you just write that out you will immediately see that it's exactly the same as taking the usual product between this matrix and this vector So that product is exactly the same as this thing. Okay. It, if you, once you write it out once, you'll oh yes, you, you'll see it. But if you if you have never done that, then I apologise. I should have warned you about that. Okay. So I'm not going to use the index notation very much, um, but I do a little bit later on in the lectures. That brings us up to date with where we were. Um, at the end of yesterday's lecture. <coughs> um, and we had just got to the point, well, let me remind myself where we'd got to. Yeah, so we just got to the point of asking, uh, so, so I'd argued that the Lorentz transformations um, and the rotations and uh, translations which we use as well in order to get the most general Lorentz trans so the specific Lorentz transformations and the rotations and translations can all be written in this form for some uh, various choices of this matrix and this vector this vector gives you the translations space translations and time translations and this matrix gives you the Lorentz transformation this one but in the form of a matrix. And then I asked, I finished the lecture by saying, but not all matrices here will, will work. Okay? It's, you, you can't put any matrix in here. If you just wrote down a general 4x4 four four real matrix, it won't necessarily correspond to a Lorentz transformation, including rotations. It won't. So what's the condition? Well, it turns out you, what you can easily check. What's the condition? Okay. You can easily check, and in fact it's an exercise, that if you do this transformation here, then what you get is the following. So if you, if you calculate, if you take, for, for any vector t, x, y, z, for any values of t, x, y, and z, in other words, any event in space-time, you calculate c, t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared. And then you calculate, using the Lorentz transform, the same expression but in the primed coordinates. So this is not t to the power 12, it's t dashed squared, okay. Um, c t dashed squared minus x dashed squared minus y dashed squared minus z, you calculate that. 
and they're equal. They're always equal. And it's an exercise for you. It's rather boring. So have a glass of wine handy or something because it's just algebra. You just, instead of t, the, t dash there, you put that expression and square it. It all works. I'll show you, um, maybe later in this lecture or maybe tomorrow, a quicker way of doing this. So if you can't be bothered with this algebra, then wait and I'll show you a quicker way of doing it. <coughs> so, it's, it is, so it's an exercise that that form, that quadratic form there, is invariant. Okay? So the two observers will disagree about quite a lot. They'll disagree about t and x and y and z in general, but they agree about this number. It's invariant. Um, <coughs> and it turns out that that's going to be, that's going to give us the condition. So we define the Lorentz group of transformations is the group of four by four real matrices. So it's all of the four by four real matrices such that Um, they preserve this form. Uh, in my notes, I've written it using the x noughts. So it's all of the 4x4 four four real matrices which keep that unchanged. Okay? We know that the Lorentz transforms that we've already found do that. That's what I just said over there. And in fact, that's all of them. Right? There aren't any others. Uh, that's not quite true. This group also includes the reflections, not only space reflections, but also time reflections. In fact, one of you asked me about that. Yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> so the Lorentz group includes the standard Lorentz transformations, spatial rotations, spatial reflections, spatial translations, time reflections, and time translations. Okay, and all of those things together give you the full Lorentz group. And in fact, this, uh, we can take this as a definition. Of course, I should prove, I'm not going to, that, that this that there isn't anything else in this group that we haven't already met. <coughs> okay. There isn't, but I haven't actually proved that. Um, <coughs> we need something else, though. Um, <coughs> we need... So, so that would, that, that's the condition on these matrices, but actually we need transformations like this. Ah, I'm sorry, I said something wrong, didn't I? You should have stopped me. I said the Lorentz group included the translations, and it doesn't. Right. Here are the translations. So the group which preserves this is actually everything except the translations. Um, <coughs> here are the translations. So that's a bigger group than the Lorentz group. It's called the Poincaré group. So the Poincaré group is the Lorentz group plus translations, both space translations and time translations. Oops. In other words, th this bit is the Lorentz group and the whole thing now is the Poincaré group. <coughs> okay, that good. And it's very similar mathematically to two-dimensional Euclidean geometry, this, this group structure here. In two-dimensional Euclidean geometry, um, <coughs> you can make a group 
out of just the rotations, the plane rotations and the plane reflections and that forms a group and it's O2 for the mathematicians. But to get the full Euclidean group you have to also include the translations, okay? And then you've got the full Euclidean group. Okay. And this is essentially the same, of course it's in four dimensions and it's, it's not Euclidean because it's got this plus minus 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 signature. So it's definitely not Euclidean. Okay, so uh, what we should be doing now for the next few lectures is studying how the Poincaré group acts on R4 and what are its invariants. Remember I said yesterday that we're treating special relativity as a geometry, so we've got a space, a mathematical space and a group acting. And this is the correct group, the Poincaré group. But it, t it turns out that almost all of the really interesting things, the new things that we're going to discover, we will find just by using these special Lorentz transforms. So we don't, we don't need to worry about making things more complicated. Yeah, question? What's the geometry, what's the geometry Ha, of this, this quadratic form? Yeah, I'm going to say a lot about that. Okay, so I, I'm going to ask you to wait. You, you will see that um, it's a sort of distance, right? It doesn't have, I mean, it's not positive definite, right? So it's not like Euclidean distance, which is positive definite. This can be negative. So it's, but it, it's, so it's, it's not a, t technically it's not a metric. It's what's called a pseudo metric because it's not, so it satisfies the other conditions for a metric, but it, it's not positive definite. I'm going to, most of my lectures are going to be explaining the physical significance of this. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll find out, okay? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, <coughs> so now we're going to, so I, so I basically finished now introducing the Lorentz transform, explaining how it sits inside the Poincaré group, and we should be studying the Poincaré group, but we find out that we can get almost all the information we need by doing something simpler, namely playing around with these and, and observing what happens to this uh, quadratic form. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is write down several exercises. Um, if you've got my lecture notes, you don't need to write them down. First exercise is something we discussed yesterday. Um, it's number eight if you've got the lecture notes. I advise you to become familiar with the function gamma. Gamma is a function of V, remember. Um, I better write it down here in the sunshine. And it's quite a good idea to become familiar with that function. And so what I do in the exercise is I ask you to write it out as a power series in V or in V over C. And, uh, and then draw a graph, get, or get a machine to draw a graph for you of gamma against V. And you'll see how it behaves. And as we discussed yesterday, um, <coughs> unless V is a significant part of the velocity of light C, gamma is essentially 1. Which explains why we didn't, discuss special, didn't discover special relativity hundreds of years. Galileo would have found it. You can also see something else, actually, that V <coughs> uh, can't actually be equal to C. V cannot be equal to C yes. because you would be dividing by zero here. In other words, gamma becomes infinite. It has a singularity if you try to put V equals C. If you try to put V greater than C, then this is well defined, but it's complex. <laughs> okay. So v, v must, in order for this to be a real number, which it has to be, because it was supposed to be, 
these, this transformation here m must be a real linear transformation, not a complex linear transformation, a real linear transformation. So this has to be a real number, and it has to be finite. Uh, v must be less than c. So we can already see in that formula there that there appears to be an upper limit on relative velocities, which indeed there is, but we're going to explore that in more detail. I'm going to write down an abbreviated version of exercise 9. Um, S and S dashed are as usual. I'm not even bothered. I mean, they're just the standard two frames of reference over there, standard configuration. So the setup is that we've got two events in this frame which are distinct but simultaneous. So let's choose them. So let's choose one of the events to be this. Why not? Okay. It's going to be easy to work out its Lorentz transform. So why not? We choose this as one of our events. So the other event has to be simultaneous with this one. So, but it has to be different. So those are two events in S. They have the same time coordinate in S, so they're simultaneous, but they're not the same. And it, these are not all zero, so they're not the same. And now you work out the Lorentz transform of these two, and you find that this event, so this is S, and this is S dashed here, this event becomes naught, 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 and this event becomes <coughs> minus uh, v gamma x over c and then gamma x y z. So what's the time separation in s dashed? It's the difference between this number, 0, and this number. In other words, the time separation is v gamma x over c in s dashed. That's the time. So s thinks the two events are simultaneous. s dashed thinks they happen at different times. And the, the difference between those times in s dashed is this number. And <coughs> that, that number can be as big as you like. Because you can make v bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you can't make it any bigger than c. But as you make it bigger and bigger, gamma grows without limit. Okay? As you make v approach c, as v tends towards c, gamma will tend to infinity. It's still smaller. Than c. Still smaller. It's, it's approaching c from below. You're taking the limit from below. Um, so th that's why the question was carefully phrased, show that there is no limit to the time separation. You can make the time separation as big as you like, okay, by choosing V closer and closer to C. It depends on a, on a space coordinate also. Yes, it does. Um, <coughs> it does. Uh, so you just choose some, it doesn't matter what value this has, it, this would still be true, it still has no limit. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 That's, 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 that's one take this dependence on the on one of the. That, I mean, that's one of the crucial. The spatial coordinates into account in this kind of thing. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't affect the the result here. But you're right. The whole point, really, about the Lorentz transforms is that time and space have become entangled, entangled with each other cannot be avoided. That's the crucial difference, actually, between relativity and Galilean physics. Yeah, it's inevitable. So um, what we're going to do now is look at the space separation. Whoops. In S dashed. So here we looked at the time separation in S dashed. And in exercise 10 we look at the spatial separation. So in other words, we want to take the difference, the, the 
sort of Euclidean three-dimensional spatial difference between that collection X, y, uh, of values of x, y and z and this. So the spatial separation, well it's square anyway, will be this. What happens as you when you choose v larger and larger, just as we did in the previous case, you take larger and larger values for v, then this gets just bigger and bigger with no limit. And so the spatial separation just gets bigger and bigger with no limit. Right? Its smallest value is when v equals zero, and that was the original spatial separation that you started with in s. So s dashed will always see the spatial separation to be bigger, <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> and it just grows without limit. So we're going to choose two events, P and Q, and they, they are these events here. P is C, T, 1, 0, 0, 0, and Q is C, T, 2, 0, 0, 0. So <coughs> these two events took place at the origin, but they took place at different times. And um, we are going to take T2 greater than T1. Okay. In other words, uh, this event happened after this one. So T1 happened, P happened first, and then Q. <coughs> so S says that P happens before Q. Now we, so the question is, what does S dashed say? Right, what does S dashed say? So we work out what, what happens to these events in S dashed. And we get these, we get gamma C T1 and then uh, minus gamma V T1 naught naught. If you just if you just put that into the Lorentz transform, you get that, and then similarly for T two, gamma C T two, comma minus gamma V T two, comma naught naught. Again, the spatial, the x component has picked up some time stuff here, right? I'm not interested in this. I'm interested in asking the question: Which order do the events happen in, according to S dashed? Well, if you look at these two, uh, gamma C T2, gamma is positive, C is positive, so gamma C T2 must be greater than gamma C T1, because T2 was taken to be greater than C T1. And therefore, S dashed agrees that although the time separation between these two events is different, they happened in the same order. Right. And that's very reassuring <laughs> because event P might have caused event Q. So it would be catastrophic for physics if we could use the Lorentz transformation to put the two events in a different order. Again, it's S and S dashed in the usual arrangement. And we're going to Suppose something that we're going to show can't happen. So, so don't be too alarmed, OK? So two events, P and Q. Suppose information can be sent from this event to this event at a speed U greater than light. We're going to show that this is not possible. Okay. So suppose it is possible. We're going to find out something that goes wrong. Got two events. 
lying on the x-axis, uh, the x difference between them is delta x, the t difference between them is delta t, taken to be positive, you've got them in that order, and you imagine that, so the, the speed that you need to travel at in order to get from one event to the other event is u, and we're going to say, can u be greater than c? Actually, um, it's only information which I'm expecting to do this. I'm not expecting any of you to travel this fast. I'm, I'm saying, can information travel faster than light? Just by using the Lorentz transform, in S dashed, we've got delta T dashed equals, and we use the, the Lorentz transform over there, but with deltas in front of all the variables, delta T dashed equals gamma delta t minus v delta x over c squared and I can write that as gamma delta t 1 minus v delta x over delta t over c squared so that's v u over c squared all right we, we're going to be able to choose v in such a way that this number is negative, this was positive, this is positive, and therefore this number will be negative. And therefore, in this frame of reference, once I've shown you that I can do it, Q will precede P. The event Q in this frame of reference will happen before P. Okay. And that's what's telling us that we could not possibly send information from P to Q because Q happened first, according to somebody else. 1 minus V U over C squared to be negative. That's going to be true if and only if V U over C squared is greater than 1. And that's true if and only if V over C is greater than c over u, <coughs> if I've done that right, I have, haven't I? Uh, so how do I know that I can choose v to make this happen? Well, I can because u is greater than c, and therefore c over u is less than 1. So this is a fixed number less than 1. And so I can choose my velocity to be such that this is a little bit bigger than this without having to make v equal to c or greater than c. Okay. So I can't make this 1 or greater than 1, but I can make it anything I like less than 1. I've got a number less than 1 and I've got an open interval above it, and so I just, all right, I just choose v over c so that it's greater than this, but still less than 1. So I can choose an inertial frame in standard configuration which, in which Q precedes P, and so it could not have been possible for any information to travel from P to Q with that superluminal velocity. Let's have, well, questions if there are any. Yeah, that's a good question, thank you. So the question is, uh, why did I not already know that, really? What's the difference between this v and that u? This v was the vol relative velocity of two inertial frames, okay? And we've already seen that it must be less than the velocity of light. This is more general, right? Because I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying that no information can travel faster than the velocity of light. This tells us that no inertial frame can travel faster than light because of this. This says, never mind about inertial frames, no information can travel faster than light, which is somehow more general. OK? Any more questions? Thank you. Yes, question up here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, people seeing the light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, if we imagine another plane, which 
which goes twice as fast yeah. as the first play. In the, in the other play, uh, one will see that the, uh, one person sees the other, uh, sees the light before the other person. Yeah, yeah. But in, in the ground, you will see that the other person sees the light yeah, before yeah, the other. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in, a, in, a, in one frame, event A happens before B. Yeah. But in another frame, event B happens before Yeah. But no information passed from those two events to each, one, from one event to the other. So you can, you can disagree, you can have different observers saying this event happened first and then this one. And then another observer can say no, this event happened second, this was the one which happened first. And that's okay, that they can disagree and there's no problem with that. What we will find is that those two events, they are going to be what we call space-like separated. In other words, they're going to be separated from each other in such a way that to get from one event to the other, you have to travel at a speed faster than light. Right. So, so no information can travel from... If you say that P happens before Q, and I say that Q happens before P, that's okay, we just agree to differ. But in that case, P and Q will be such that no information can travel either from P to Q or from Q to P. In other words, if, if you measure the speed that you would have to move at to get from P to Q or from Q to P, it would be greater than C, which this example shows can't happen. So the two events are completely independent of each other and it doesn't matter if I say one happened first and you say the other one happened first, they don't influence each other, so it doesn't matter. It's a bit weird that, and that's one of the things that um, people had to get used to when Einstein first wrote down special relativity, abandoning the idea of global simultaneity that we all agree about. You, you think, well, surely we're going to argue. Well. We disagree politely with each other, but it doesn't matter. You see, if, if the two events were such that you can get from one of them to the other one at a speed less than the velocity of light, then we will always agree about which event happened first. Right? So that's good. <laughs> if the two events are the other way, namely you can only get from one event to the other by travelling faster than light, then we can disagree about which happens first, but that's okay. We just give up on the idea of always agreeing about the timings of things, and it doesn't matter. Yeah? Wouldn't we have, in that case, like, wouldn't we lose causality? No, because you see, <coughs> what is the question? The, the question is, will we, ha have we lost causality? In that case. In that case. Um, if, the two, if the two events are such that we might disagree about which one came first. So you say P came first and I say Q came first, all right? Then neither event could possibly cause the oh. other one, right? Because Causality travels at, at fastest at the speed of light. But can't that happen with any event? Uh, yeah. But then no event could cause another. Well, f um, if you take any event, right, there will be lots of other events which are completely causally independent, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so if we take the event which is now, okay, here, that event, there'll be lots of events. So for example, um, if we imagine that um, on the, uh, a planet orbiting a star in the galaxy Andromeda, um, there was a, an alien giving a lecture, right? And the, the alien did that at the same time as me, according to some frame of reference. There's no way that I can influence that alien because the light 
the, the time it takes to travel to Andromeda it is huge, you see. I, I can't cause anything. If I want to cause something, in a, how far away is the galaxy of Andromeda? Billions of light years? Uh, anyway, it's, uh, is it millions or billions? Anyway, it's a long time before anything that happens in this galaxy can affect Andromeda. The light that we see from Andromeda, I think it's millions, isn't it? Is millions of years old. So nothing, so Andromeda might have exploded, I hope not, but it might have done, and we won't find out for millions of years. So nothing can cause anything here until long in the future. I'm going to say more about this in, a, in, a future, in another lecture, actually. But this is just the beginning. This. We should stop. Let's have a break. Let's have a break. Thank you for your questions.